Well, the other thing people ask me all the time is, uh, I don't see how you get to the ideas you get to. It's like, I couldn't see that. How can you see that? I said, I, I use a different mind than you do. Not than you have or could use, but you have to learn to think through a different paradigm. And I've spent my whole life doing that. So when I listen to people talk, I can hear that they're thinking through an old paradigm, usually with good intentions. They're not bad actors in the world, but their way of thinking doesn't let them see what it is that the effect really is. Carol Sanford is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Carol is an award-winning business educator, summit producer, podcaster, and author. Her books are required business school reading at Stanford and Harvard. For 40 years, she collaborated with clients to develop people to realize their inherent capabilities. Carol's clients include Fortune 500 companies like Colgate, DuPont, 7th Generation. Google's Innovation Lab uses her responsible business framework. You can learn more about all her business works and her books and that uh, at her websites, and those will be listed in the show description. She is a senior fellow of social innovation at Babson College. CEO of the Regenerative Paradigm Institute, educator and social change designer for people in, in change agent roles, organizational leaders who aspire to making a difference, business and organizational teams pursuing meeting, work, and business effectiveness. She is the author of five best-selling books, including The Regenerative Life, which is the last one, that I have right here in front of me. I'm holding it up. Uh, wonderful read. And that's really the main reason I contacted Carol today. Um, another one I have in front of me is The Regenerative Business. And uh, that was, I believe, her third, third book that she wrote. There are regenerative life, transform any organization, our society, your destiny, no more feedback, the Regenerative Business, who Michael Bakker of Google, um, who is the vice president at Google, wrote the foreword. 22 gold awards thus far for these books, for these five books. All five books are built around case stories of specific transformation in people, business, community, and regions. Um, I, I'm so excited to have Carol here on the show. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Mark. Very kind of you to let people know about my work. I appreciate that. You're most welcome. It's very you're very well spoken, and I've seen you on on stage a few times, and you excite your audiences. And your writing is absolutely amazing. I I would have to say these books are, uh, and you probably would say so as well. I guess that's probably the first question. They like a series. Do they all belong together? Do they kind of build upon each other or support each other? Well, they all come out of my life and my experience. So they're all of a whole. Uh, I wrote them by being asked in almost every case. My first book, The Responsible Business, which my publisher would not let me call the regenerative business. I thought that was a strange word, right? Too long ago. It came because many of my clients who I would say, would you talk to this vice president or president or something uh, about this work? And eventually they said, why don't you write a book and we will testify to our work in the book. So I wrote the first one. Then, the, then people said to me, wonderful book, but it feels like it's for big companies. All your stories are big. They weren't quite, but I could see how that's what they thought. They said, I'm an entrepreneur. I've got a, a startup kind of mind. So I wrote the second one, The Responsible Entrepreneur, partly to give people a, an idea of what could be done, even in a very, very small business. And then uh, and people said, well, I need to know how to do more of this. 
thyroid, the regenerative business, which is, I mean, it's not really quite a how-to book, but it gives you an overarching picture of the transition businesses go through. And then in the regenerative business, I wrote one chapter, chapter five, I think it is, called The 30 Toxic Practices. Because it isn't a matter of adding on to what you currently do. 90% of what I'm doing is creating product substitutions for the way people currently work. And they stop many things and instead uh, redesign a very different way. Those 30, I'm now, we'll see how, um, but my plan is to write a book about each era and no more feedback, which you mentioned, I think is the most base destructive uh, toxic practice. And that most people can't see it. They are still convinced because it's familiar. They can't see themselves and they have to have somebody else. People always say, no, it turns out you don't. And if you get feedback from other people, it will undermine increasing your ability. And then finally, so, well, not finally, because as you know, I have one more book coming, but the fifth book came about because I had individuals saying, what if I'm not the head of a corporation? What if I'm not the head of a business unit? Can I do anything? I thought, shoot, yeah, you can. So I wrote a book called The Regenerative Life, uh, which I think we're going to talk about a bit more. And it's really for individuals to be able to change their life. So it's all of a whole, but it's kind of targeted at different aspects of that. I love that. And so the this you you tickled on the, the sixth book that's coming out or hopefully will come out soon. It's kind of this epistemology. Uh, can you tell us, tease us a little bit more of what, what to expect there? Well, the other thing people ask me all the time is, uh, I don't see how you get to the ideas you get to. It's like, I couldn't see that. How can you see that? I said, I, have, I use a different mind than you do. Not than you have or could use, but you have to learn to think through a different paradigm. And I've spent my whole life doing that. So when I listen to people talk, I can hear that they're thinking through an old paradigm, usually with good intentions. They're not bad actors in the world, but their way of thinking doesn't let them see what it is that the effect really is. And so I, this book is called Indirect Work because the primary problem we have is, as Einstein said, um, we're using the old mind that created the problem to try and do the new one. So we don't know how to get out of a billiard ball model of change. Uh, let me say what that means. It's, it's a fun, fun way. But Einstein was a pretty smart guy, as we all know. And when people ask him what he meant by that, don't use the old paradigm or old mind, he said, well, <clears throat> We're currently here in the early 20th century, which is where he was, working from a Newtonian mind. And that means a billiard ball mind, where we think, ah, there's a pocket on the billiard table. That's where people should be. All those balls on the table are the people, and we're the cue stick. And if we hit that cue stick or move that cue stick, us, uh, to move the person that's on the table into the pocket we have chosen. That's how we think change work. We have to do it directly. The quantum uh, idea is understanding that everything is moved in the field. It's not direct. If you advocate, if you advise, if you coach, mentor, if you uh, try and create restructuring, all those are directly trying to bring about change they will bring about more restraint and more uh, resistance and it will cause uh, what you're doing to go completely awry. You have to learn to think with the mind that sees the whole at work. That's a key working, not its pockets and so forth. So this new book is about that, which underlies all of my writing, not just my book I've written I don't know, a hundred and something papers which are published around. If you want to know how to think about it from a quantum mindset, that's what this book is about. 
That's amazing. I'm excited for that. And I'm so glad that you could tease us a little bit about it and that you've obviously been working on it for a while. I really want to jump back a little bit to, to the most important question. Um, and that is, how have you been? How are you doing it? And I want to frame that first. We've been in two years almost of absolute craziness, lockdown, pandemics, Black Lives Matters, Asian racism, crazy inauguration, and all sorts of other things going on around the world, climate change and, and things happening. Um, I, I want to know if all these years of work, you've been writing these books, you've been writing other papers, you've been coaching people, you've been coaching businesses, and... and, and I don't coach. I don't coach. Or not, okay, not direct, coach. So. Yeah. Yeah, educate. I'm an educator. Educate. You're an right. absolute an so, educator. I, you're not a coach. I'm sorry for that. And I appreciate you correcting me. I won't. Um, <clears throat> basically, helping people to get to um, uh, educating them and get them to a different place. And it's almost a transformation or a, a, a process, obviously, that can take sometimes a, a lot of time. In, in your books, you also you talk, uh, you give a lot of people notepads, diaries, so to say, to take a, to catalog or write down their journey or what they're going through and kind of because it's such a process. Um, but, but what I'm asking is, one, I want to honestly know, how did you weather all this craziness in this weird time, but all that work that you did before, has it proven to be a better model for life and business to weather hard times, to kind of be more resilient, to get you through craziness that's going on in the world because you have a better model, not only for life, but for your business to, to get through those. And, and maybe uh, in your personal life, but maybe you also receive some feedback from those people that you've worked with over the years that says, Boy, Carol, thanks for all your help. This really helped us weather this hard time. We were prepared. Um, that's a lot. Let's see. Yeah. I um, the work I use is ancient. It's not new. It has been generated in indigenous communities, which you know, as having read the regenerative life that. I have heritage through Mohawk, a Mohawk, part Mohawk grandfather, who did get uh, the, the blessings and the generosity of his family to learn the indigenous ways. And he was uh, probably the primary source of my staying sane as I was growing up, because I was in a household with a mentally ill mother and a cruel, very uh, destructive father. Uh, that's probably an answer to your question in some way. If you can get through that kind of stuff, you know you're working with something that matters. My work also comes from ancient lineage teachings. I have uh, submitted my own being to a few different traditions, a few from kind of an academic study but others from living inside of them for years, like uh, looking at and living inside of Mahayana Buddhism. It's in a bit, but uh, more Mahayana, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, some out of India and special branches of Hinduism through Sri Aurobindo and the mother, through Socrates and Pythagoras, which both had a spiritual aspect to them. They were working on consciousness and not just how to make your life better in the world. All of those things are <clears throat> passed through my life, through my living, and they, in, they are infused in everything that I uh, introduce to people. In th that process, uh, I try do what I call transliterated. I take it out of the ancient terminology and I put it into quantum terminology, not into modern popular psychology terminology. And many people think that my that I'm using words uh, that ought to change and make them so everybody would understand them. 
But if I did that, I would be putting, giving you words that don't represent what you need to think now. They need to be, <clears throat> um, the words themselves are very precise. The phrasing is very precise. Also based on those ancient kind of uh, ways of thinking and organizing of thinking. If we can come forward, move ourselves into saying, well, why would she use that word? And by the way, most of them are not my words. They're real words. Well, I made up the word life shed. I don't think that exists. Uh, I may have made up a few others, but for the most part, they're words that really exist. But you have to be willing to walk into uh, for them to meet the criteria you were talking about in uh, troubled times, you have to be willing to move you. Now, I want to offer something to your listeners if it interests them, but you have to listen carefully and understand how to get to it. And uh, we can put this in your show notes if you want. Great. I, during the early part of the pandemic, created something called the morning meetings. And I ran them, I think, 20 days in a row right at the beginning, right through weekends, everything else. And they were all about how to take the work I've been offering uh, and uh, generating more even during that period and use it in what I called uncertain times. How do you work with disruption? And so I took another uh, level and I went very public. I did it uh, for anyone who was on my newsletter uh, I offer free, th free things to them every so often. So it was on the newsletter or they, they can invite someone if they want my newsletter. They came for 30 minutes uh, fairly early in the morning because I had people all over the world. I had people in Australia, New Zealand, Japan getting up in the middle of the night to do these uh, morning meetings. Now, the way your listeners can get to it is you go to Facebook and you search for the regenerative life community and you ask to join and do not go away. I never ever go look at it. I don't go approve people. I've set it up so that it asks you three questions immediately. If you answer those three questions, you get in. If you don't answer them, you wonder why I never let you in. So. That whole idea was to respond to your question, Mark, that you just asked is, uh, I use that material. I, as a part of my meditative practice, a part of my research, as a part of my writing, I don't write to tell you what I know. I write to tell you what I'm trying to figure out. And I make myself work through some uh, more, uh, or let's call it deeper way to come to an answer. And at the end, I have a book that's educated me about what I've discovered for now. As I said to you earlier, I often send it off to the publisher and go, shoot, I wish I'd asked that part and done that kind of thing. And I feel like I'm already behind and now I've got another book I gotta write or a paper. So the answer is the wisdom about how to deal with up and down times, I call them, uh, is universal, uh, it's learnable. Most of us do not grow up in a world where we learn how to see ourselves, see our reactivity, our ego, or if we do go off somewhere like in a retreat, we don't learn how to do it in daily life, which is what my work is about. The karma yoga, someone called it, it's a uh, you're understanding the life you're living and you do yoga while you go to work, while you have a family. And those kind of processes have you not only be okay in the ups and downs, but to grow your being, your soul, and to be a, a more evolved being. That was a long answer. <laughs> I hope I'm, it got I'm, to what I'm, you were asking. I'm absolutely so glad that you gave me the long answer because we're about, uh, we really want to be about the depth or substance. And you've put a lot of time in, into all of this and to all of your work. And there's not, uh, and I thank you for sharing the Facebook tools. 
You're also the executive producer of the Regenerative Business Summit, which is coming up, I believe, in November. Uh, we want to tease. Yeah. And you also have, I mean, if we're going to list this all in the show note description, all your links, all your social media, all the places they can find and get in touch with you and to your with your tools. But no matter what you do, you're continually offering these freebies and tools and places and downloads and you can get this and so uh, um, it, you're really an educator who's also really wants to to share a lot of this and so we'll put all those links there um, you kind of tickled upon this with the title of your books is in your direction it really want you did you kind of want them all to be kind of part of this regenerative series and in, in some respects but you get you receive pushback from from your publishers and say no what you know we don't want to call that regenerative uh business responsible business is better is that kind of the direction that they were all going and more in this regeneration so i when i was thinking about books i wasn't thinking about it. i've got to write a whole bunch of books i thought i was gonna write one book uh and that's because I don't believe I give people much of anything except a curiosity of, of many people say to me, I've been looking for you forever. And they don't mean me. They've been saying a way to engage things the way you do. And even the words you gave me helped me. And so I, I knew that if people were close to me, they were working and I do all my work in membership communities so that people say for my entire life or at least the next big chunk of it i want to be in this process and learn how to do the life i live the work i do in a very different way so if, if i really am seeking with books to give people a path to a process or a path to a community because I also don't, the other reason I don't think books do much except let us find a door is that they don't give us a community to work in. And you can't, I don't care how good a meditator you are all by yourself in the morning and evening, or how good a student you are by going and getting your master's and PhD and reading and writing and doing a dissertation. None of that will change you. Reading books is knowledge acquisition. Real change comes from moving from knowledge to understanding, where an understanding happens when we pass it through our being and our life. We go uh, uh, take a, a work idea, you know, kind of a soul work idea, and we go apply it when we go to work the next day and the next day and the next day, and then to our family and then to our, our change agent work in the world. That process is what really brings about change. Books are basically nothing, although they can have a long life and they can go places. Like if somebody says to me, who reads your book? I, I have no idea unless people like you say, I read your book uh, and then I'm delighted. So they have that opportunity. I was working with the idea of re regeneration, going back to a big part of your question, um, 50 years ago. So although that write-up on my biography said 40 years, I'm 10 years past when that was written, I was thinking as I heard it. Um, and I call uh, things by various names usually to be disruptive. The problem with regeneration right now, although it's one of four types of work and in one of my books, I talk more about uh, why it is, well, why it's generally so important. But the, the problem is ideas become popularized and people jump on the bandwagon and they try and put their stamp on it. And so they're not from the sacred lineage of what regeneration means. My grandfather, taught me uh, and he knew the word regeneration and he knew a version of it in Mohawk uh, but he taught me to understand that regeneration was more about revelation and I, I mean that in two ways uh, one is that you can 
reveal something that can't be seen uh, in kind of like a detective using your mind in a different way. But you also can reveal something in you that you didn't know. So the word reveal is closer, but people have translated regeneration now in the popular press and their work to mean restore, renew. They're taking everything that was already popular, biomimicry, circular, sustainability, and they're renaming it that. I call it the beat to fit and paint to match. So you beat what you're doing into, so it crams into and you're saying, I'm doing regeneration and you're not. Because uh, if you were in a direct mode, we talked about my new book earlier, where you're doing things in a community or a field or a family and you're doing it to move that thing, those people into a pocket you think they should be in, you're not doing regeneration you're doing something else. And so I have uh, had the same set of ideas since I was probably 12 or 13 years old uh, when my grandfather kind of rescued me from the household I was living in. Uh, but I didn't understand it all until I passed through Berkeley. I studied with Thomas Kuhn for the couple of years he was there. Uh, uh, lecturing. He wrote The Structure of the Scientific Revolution. It's in the real version of that library somewhere behind you, right? That book. And it, I have it on my shelf life. right here. It's a yep. wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. And Thomas Kuhn is a great man. Uh, he didn't actually know how to tell people how to go find paradigms. He just knew they existed. Uh, and when I studied with him, it was such a powerful experience because it shook loose everything I'd believed about, well, what I was taught in my church and by my family is truth. And I'm never to question. In fact, I got a little trouble questioning it sometimes. But if you study and you internalize it, so I started, I started with my grandfather, then Thomas Kuhn. Then I studied Socrates and uh, the whole pre-Socratic philosophers and their sacred teachings translated into daily life. As I did all of that, I came to, at first it profoundly changed me. If I look at who I was as the small child that I start the regenerative life with and the college stuff I went through and then the the various spiritual traditions, that's what I'm trying to write about, not something called regeneration. And But now you'll find me doing a lot because people are undermining or they're co-opting and banalizing and greenwashing the idea of regeneration and missing the sacred nature of living systems and the... Um, the idea that my grandfather said it's about revealing, revealing the essence of something, revealing the soul, uh, and doing the work to build a mind that can do that. Again, another long answer, but uh, you ask great questions. That's perfectly fine. I, I, like I said, I have Thomas Kuhn here on my bookshelf, and it, it's a yeah fa fabulous book. Uh, do you know that? Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but. John Elkington said that was one of his influential reads and, yeah. and people that really changed um, his whole thinking. You, you you hit the nail on the head right away, and I'm so glad you did on this. There There is not only a movement, but almost the buzzword or kind of the trendiness of re regenerative, re regeneration right now. Um, matter of yeah. fact, just in another, I think it's another uh, six days, Paul Hawkins' book, Regeneration, comes out um, from Penguin, I, I believe yeah. it is, uh, comes out. And um, it, there, there is all, there's some uh, things in there about meditation. There's all, also um, John Elkington's in the book, uh, Jane Goodall, uh, things. Uh, there's another book here that I have. It's re called Regenerative Leadership. Um, it's uh, not that old. I would say it's a, uh, about two years old from uh, Gillis Hutchins and Laura Storm is, is a wonderful book as well. So, um, but I believe 
exactly what you're talking about with kind of not only ancient wisdom, indigenous wisdoms, and the way you talk about regeneration and, and uh, uh, um, re re revelation or how you reveal something is, is very spot on. I think there's a lot of different terms and a lot of people kind of using it as, as the buzzword. I do a lot of uh, regenerative ag agriculture. And um, so I I've gotten just since this movement has come about, I've gotten a lot of people asking me to speak about regenerative models, regeneration. And when I go to speak, they think I'm going to talk about regenerative agriculture. I don't talk about that. I talk about connecting us to the earth, to the to the soil, to one another, to this ancient indigenous wisdom, and how how we can get that that um, that real ancient wisdom, that connection back that we've lost. We we become numb. We've disconnected ourselves from one another and and many things. And in your book, uh, regenerative life, a couple of times you you kind of uh, I don't know if it's advice or you stop people and say you need to connect first. You need to find out your your yourself and then you need to understand your employees your your life those around you and listen and and make that connection in in some respects and and um i really uh, i really like the the way you did that because it it even threw me off in many respects of how much mm -hmm. we've just got to reconnect with with uh, uh, and understand and listen and uh, uh, with each other, and that it's a, a process that just doesn't happen like that. That's why a lot of a lot of the, uh, or I guess everyone, receives a notebook or has some kind of a journal that kind of it's a something that happens over many days that where they kind of write down the experience or the the process that they're taking to get those aha moments or to get to were they really thinking about the steps? And so um, that being said, I, I love how you hit the nail on the head, but I wanna go even um, further. I wanna ask, and then I wanna come back to your family. I wanna ask about people like Paul Hawken or John Elkington and uh, these wisdoms who are coming out with new books and talking about regeneration. I hope in, in a very good way, how they really connect to your books and, and your your way of um, writing and, and, and what you offer as education to people, if they're in alignment or if you even maybe work with those people as well. And what is your, um, my feeling, uh, and I would like to know your feeling of connecting people to back to the earth and to indigenous wisdoms and ways of doing things doesn't mean always going back to the roots. There's a modern way we can do it and still be connected to ancient wisdom. Um, but how do you see that? Do you, do you see that it has something to do with regenerative agriculture? It has something to do with these old indigenous ways of way we used to see the world and be connected more with our earth or is it totally different? So you had so many questions in there. Yeah. I'm not sure where to start. Um, I know, I don't know the people you mentioned personally. I know that uh, some of them, Paul for sure, has worked with some of the people who work closely with me. Uh, I have not read his new book. I have, uh, in most work, I'm not going to comment. I haven't read their new work, so I can't comment. But in the most people still use an old mind to talk about regeneration is one of the reasons I took the seven first principles of living systems, which is what it was called, uh, that my grandfather offered and said, judge yourself whether or not you're actually working from a living systems view versus you're taking a bunch of stuff. So you can interview, you know, um, various people, everyone from the Dalai Lama to uh, uh, indigenous peoples and even um, 
Jane Goodall, for example, who's lived in the, the wild with um, amazing creatures. But if you don't have a mind that knows how to work from those seven first principles of living systems, you usually end up with a fragmented presentation of the work. And uh, all the work I've seen in the past from people who are using regeneration and you know the, the whole idea of regenerative leadership or design, all of them end up with lists of things or chapter headings which are trying to cover a set of stuff, but they aren't working from nested holes. They don't start with holes, they start with concepts and they start with um, the pieces and parts and then they try and put them back together again. So they, uh, like you used the word earlier, connect. I don't believe that's the answer. I don't believe it's about connection. A connection is when you've got parts and are been separated and you're trying to put it back together. So when I'm reading books people put out or listening, I listen through these seven first principles, which I did a pretty good job of articulating in the regenerative life. My newest book, Indirect Work, they're foundational to we have to switch. So we start not with uh, ideas and with problems and with issues and causes and all those things that fragment us. We have to start with holes and holes nested. So a child is nested in a family, in a community, in a region, in a nation, on a planet. And each of those are specific. A specific child in a specific family. And if we can't learn to see holes, uh, and I'm not saying wholeness. Wholeness is like aspiring to uh, doing all, putting all of me in there, the good, the bad, and everything. I'm not talking about that. And I do see that uh, as a definition of um, regeneration and reconnecting us. So every time I hear somebody write or speak or try and present uh, the idea that's talking about connectedness and relatedness, I know they're not working from an indigenous wisdom or from a lineage tradition their own ego is taking all the things they know and writing it. And I have to watch me. I grew up in this culture, right? So I was indoctrinated to think about it. it's reconnecting, it's relinking, it's relating. Yep. No. Uh, so I can't comment on each of the specific people, but I would say at first, I think people ought to learn to assess themselves. That's why the seven first principles I put out so and gave people a way to use them to says whether you're really in um, a more spiritualized whole uh, systemic understanding, not connected, not related, but systemic working of a whole. And they should listen to other people to see if they are. I I just did a keynote, uh, two openings for. The Sustainable Brands Conference and another one for a group that's today, I pre-recorded uh, Tur in Turkey. And what I said was, pick something you're trying to work on right now, a project, an endeavor, and check yourself. But also listen to everybody else who gets on a platform, every book you read. And see if they are operating from the mind that can see these indigenous seven first principles. And are they checking themselves? And can you ask questions that wake them up to that? So I haven't seen any good books that are doing that, to tell you the truth. And there are so many with that or generation. People say, what do you think of this book? I give them what I just gave you and said, I'm I'm not going to comment on the book yeah, I agree. and the author, right? What I want is people learning to be discerning and and rigorous and disciplined about reading people's ideas and their own, because that's the only way we get to the revelation process, to the finding the essence of something, not some other big name writing a book, putting the name yeah. regeneration on it. And taking over and seizing, that's what I mean, co-opting an idea to their own path.
with good intentions. I don't think these are anybody who's writing bad or evil. I agree. They're just not being rigorous enough because they their own ego is invested and their career and income usually. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you know, for, I've spoken for sustainable brands all over the world as well. And I'm uh, good friends with Coan. You know, Coan. You've had her on one of your right. podcasts, and so. Uh, well, I've seen your yeah. seen your work for sustainable brands, and I uh, also uh, how you sp how you speak as well. And I understand that. And what really needs to be clear, I guess, or needs to come out is um, what you're saying. And I'd li like you because you say it in such so, so more eloquently than I do. A lot of it's about the words we choose, about the way we communicate, about. You know, yeah. the it's not a health care system. It's a sick care system type of a thing. You know, you have to be sick to get into the system. And so um, a, a lot of it's on how we communicate and understand. And, and you seem pretty so precise about some of those things you mean. mean and um, I would just like to, you know, those words we choose, the structure and the principles we choose are, are also very important. And, and how else do you feel about how, how we communicate about them? Is that a big problem that we've had that uh, we're not understanding it right? We're using it for greenwashing and for other purposes? The problem with all uh, languages, which are either, um, I mean, the Western languages, anything that's alphabetic, an alphabetic language is problematic because in the words themselves are the uh, fragmentation. So if you think about how to describe a tree or a forest, people will divide up the tree into roots, leaves, uh, this is a David Bohm story that I'm borrowing, who wrote Wholeness in the Implicate Order. He's a physicist who was a, um, a colleague, but also a student of Einstein's. And he said, we think about trees as made up of their leaves, their twigs, their roots, their uh, bark. And we can't actually see that a tree uh, is a whole. In fact, he challenges us. He said, or maybe this is me that figured out. I walk over to it and I say, show me where the twig stops and the leaf begins. And then show me where the twig stops and the branch begins. You can't. You, there's no, it's a working whole. And that's the key. Our language doesn't help us see things working. It, it's, it, I mean, that's the first thing. It shows them it's divided. It also shows them as static and parts and pieces. So all language that is alphabetic is problematic. And you and I and 90% of the people, if not 100 on your call are raised in alphabetic languages. And that that we have to overcome that. That's a huge, huge problem because uh, it will, we have a subject, verb, object. The, the world doesn't work that way. So Bohm always said, you know, we have to create a new language. And of course, that's not very easy to do. Uh, but we have to learn to describe what we mean and try and be more precise about what we're seeing. So I said to you earlier, I made up a word and I, I'm thinking about a few others I've done too, but I kept watching people talk about watersheds and then I'd go into the next room and they were talking about air sheds and then I'd go to a group and they were talking about food sheds. And I thought, boy, this is really anthropocentric. The, and we're calling them that because that's where our water, our food, our air, and you know, there are probably at least a dozen other uh, things we impose and project onto it. I said, if we could see that as a life ship where life exists, not for us. In fact, we are one of the system that if we don't become more mindful, we diminish the life shed for all of us. But that word has spread quite a bit. And I hear people using it. And most people don't know where it came from. And ultimately, I don't really care. But I, if you think about what life shed does for your mind compared to watershed, 
uh, and how it gets rid of the fragmentation and the um, parting out things. And they, the worst thing is, is then we come up with generic solutions. All watersheds, or you can say it's one of four types of watersheds, and we can't see that every watershed, life shed, is unique and distinctive. And you as a, a farmer, right, involved in agriculture, no, no, no field, first, it doesn't have those lines on it. When we draw lines and, you know, the roads we drive on to get into or the, the hedge pasture, grows, yeah. Or the hedge grows, right, or fences we put up. Uh, what we're doing is fragmenting a, a life shed. And it's really fun to ask people, uh, and I grew up with my grandfather farming and my father ranching, so I knew something about how that happened. But I love asking people, do you know the work of this aspect of land that you're involved in, in the life shed? Do you, do you know what its work is? Do you know what it's playing with in terms of on a rainy day, what role is this? And it's fun to do it with kids in a school. Your school ground sits on a you know, quarter acre lot. Do you understand how it works in the life shed? Do you know the name of the life shed you're in? Well, the watershed it would be called. That process of learning to unfragment our mind uh, is uh, partly a language one. And we have to, and one of the ways I love working with people, my membership, my groups in my membership community, uh, I can hear the word, I, I mean, I've been doing this for decades, right? So the minute you say the word connection, I hear you, right? And I'm gonna call you out on it, right? It's insufficient to uh, what we're talking about. When you say tools, like you said, my tools, I have no tools, I have instruments. They're tools if what we do is we use them same way all the time, like a hammer always found something. Uh, but they're instruments if we're able to actually put them to work. Learning to listen to that kind of thing is a part of the education of the mind to learn to see things at work, which is fundamentally what we have to learn to do. Because when it's at work, you can't fragment it. You can't genericize it. You can't decide that there is something a human should do to get something for us. So language, I read quite a few papers on language. Uh, my son uh, owns a language company. He speaks four languages pretty uh, completely and a couple more he can understand. And as a kid, he uh, I watched him. He learned Japanese really young because there were a lot of Japanese gardeners in our neighborhood. Um, he then ended up st studying linguistics. And my grandson, even now, in addition to computer science, which is full of language, he decided to get, a, I don't think he finally did this, but he studied a lot of linguistic classes. And both of them said to me over time, all right, grandma or mom, we understand why there's you're always making us pick a word and know what we meant to say and does it do it. We need that kind of process or else we're a mess. I, I, absolutely. And I love that you're, you're giving us this deep dive. You're really taking us into that because that's so vital. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some steps forward. And then in a moment, I want to come back on and discuss the, the connection which you, you tickle upon in your books about your broken family. But I really want to, so we, we talked about Thomas Kuhn, here's his book, but in your book, you talk about Joseph Campbell. I'm a big student of D Joseph Campbell. I used to r run Joseph Campbell Circle. So this is part of the culmination of the Joseph Campbell, um, his, his big library of mythology works and things. And then I have, you know, a whole library full of other structures of Joseph Campbell. Uh, but he wrote something that really touched you that you said he wrote uh, 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 something on child rearing. And I don't know if it was in one of these mythology books or another, mm. but you but you really said that, that it was interesting that uh, uh, that's what touched you through this child rearing. And that kind of ties a little bit. 
not only to your broken family, but also what you apply to your own life and also comes out in the, in the books. Do you, do you remember a little bit more about that? Well, what I was probably talking about is he and I were both teaching at San Jose State University at the time. And so I would go sit in his classes because they came right after mine. It was like I taught at six and he taught at seven. And I'd watched, already was watching some of his programs on television. Uh, and the thing I think I was always a little surprised by, uh, I mean, I, I loved everything Campbell did because he gave the images of how it worked, but he never really uh, gave you enough to understand how people became the way they were in the, the way they were raised. You, you'd see a lot about the adults. And I remember that, I don't remember that was what I was talking about in the book, but it made me uh, constantly reflect on my own upbringing, which was uh, wonderful and horrible, right? I had the best and the worst that you can have. And it honed me in some ways. And I kept thinking that would get you to what Campbell was talking about, where you had uncles working with kids and, uh, uh, aunties and you know and he he talked about that um, young people have children in most cultures but older people raise them that fascinated me and I thought about my own grandfather compared to my father who was young and not his father this was my mother's uh, father so I I did uh, reflect on what he had and they used a lot of it and I was in my 30s when early 30s when I was teaching yeah. and he was in probably his 50s or 60s but yeah. I used it to examine my own life and it changed how I raised my children because I could not follow the path that I had been raised by you you and I I don't want to tell it for you or recant your story because no one does it better than you but you you truly came from a broken family and a, and a kind of a tumultuous area of the world. And um, not only was your your father um, a racist, a part of the Grand Dragons of the Ku Klux Klan of Texas, and and you you know I a lot of people say, hey Mark, you sound like a hillbilly <laughs> the way you talk with your drawl and that. Um, you also have a beautiful accent and, and, I, and I love it. But that's all part of our, our upbringing and things. And so for that journey, and there's many other things I'm sure you can tell, but that journey that not only shaped you and then your grandfather being a, a Mohawk native Indian, who really gave you kind of this indigenous wisdom, this ancient wisdom and taught you in many different ways. You also discuss in the book. Um, can, you, can you kind of give us a little bit more of that, how that shaped you, what that did to you, how it, 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 it's obviously, in my opinion, influenced your writings and it's been a big part, but yeah. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that because in today's day and age, matter of fact, these two years, we've been dealing with a lot of racism, Black Lives Matters, yeah. Asian racism. And so you have a unique way of looking at that and I guess dealing with it as well. I actually worry about how we're working on overcoming all of these problems. It, it literally keeps me awake at night sometimes because the more we try and tell people to not be racist, and I, I learned this really well from my father, uh, the, he was trying to tell me to be racist. And he, and maybe I should say a little bit about how he did that. Um, he, uh, he, owned, he owned farms and trucking companies. And so he hired a lot of Mexican workers who had Many of them had made it in without the right papers, and so he could hold that over their head. But he and I would play with the kids of those um, immigrants, let's call them, who were trying to immigrate into the country. Uh, he was determined to get me to see they were less than human. I mean, he, he used very dehumanizing terms. And when he would try and get me to say it back and I wouldn't, he would lock me in a closet. I mean, literally our front entry closet in the home had uh, a key 
until I would come out and say the words. His his intention was to get me to say it. And um, what it did to me, besides make me claustrophobic, and I'm having a terrible time wearing masks because uh, it, it does get internalized in your body. And I've done therapy, I've done everything, and I'm still claustro terribly claustrophobic. Um, but what it did for me is it gave me time to think. And I was four and five and six years old when he was doing this. So you wouldn't think I would have thinking, but I was, or conscious thinking. But I was going back and forth to my grandfather's house and he would be taking care of me. My grandfather, who was also a farmer, who was an advisor for the Farm Bureau and had been during the Dust Bowl, also raised pigs and we would go and he would have me experience being in a living system with pigs who would follow us down to the creek, the creek right? And uh, it was always amazing to me. He treated them like a part of our family. We would go sit by the water and mama pig or pregnant mama pig would come and lay down next to you like a dog does and uh, lean against you, right? And he would pet them. And he would talk about how life works together and how he had as a kid uh, been off with his father and grandfather. His great grandfather was full Mohawk. It, broke at that level so uh but he was very proud of the, the as he called the uh, mixed blood he had you know he was very very proud of that having those two things where i went back and forth gave me a contrast because when i went back to the closet sometime in the same day i thought about what my grandfather had said and my grandfather as i got older would teach me to love my father uh, through all of that. And, and that wasn't an easy task because my grandfather had a lot of trouble with him too. But he would constantly talk about how my grandfather was trying to fix something he thought was broken. And the problem is he hadn't learned how to see the system itself that was broken. So being in that closet with Later that day or the next day or the day before, my grandfather's wisdom about living systems eventually helped me understand that my father was broken by his family. And he was trying to figure out how to live. And it gave me maybe not a lot I could do about it because my mother eventually, uh, in spite of her illness, took him away because she was afraid he was escalating and I was I was going to be injured or worse. That has, that combination happening at that time, which my grandfather was teaching me empathy and compassion and how to understand, go inside and reveal to myself. That's a regenerative part, right? Reveal to myself what was going on inside my father and his terrible fears and his escalating fears that he had gotten from his mother, it was the real problem. Uh, knowing all of that, when I finally became an adult, I ended up, I think I tell some stories in this book, but I can never remember which stories are in which book. I worked in South Africa and Southeastern Africa, Kenya, that's Zimbabwe, a, that's a, Zambia. That's regenerative business. Okay. And I think there's some of it, no more feedback. Um, I went there and I always felt like I was going to be able to do something to make up for my father. And it was deep in me. And what I learned was, and what I keep wanting people to work on when we work on racism, is not trying to stop racism directly, right? Head on, educate them, show them what they're doing, give them the words to instead uh engage people in working what i was able i figured this out in south africa and it was life-changing for me because i wanted so much to overcome and, and i still have racism in me my father was very successful but the good news was i could see it and my my grandfather who you know being uh, part mohawk had experienced racism too all of them helped me begin to see that what made us uh, whole with the we're all human 
was doing some important work together. My grandfather would say, the Dust Bowl was a gift to us becoming more integrated country. What in the world is he talking about? Well, although there were uh, you know, shortages of food, a terrible problem, for the most part, people had to band together and do work. Once they came to know each other, know the essence of one another, things changed. So when I went into Colgate in South Africa and had that three years just as Mandela was coming into office, I knew we were dealing with eight tribes, plus we had uh, Afrikaans and the English. We were had a company divided up by your race in terms of what jobs you could have. And so I could have gone in, brought someone who was black side by side, we educate people. Instead, I created something called uh, Promises Beyond Ableness. And that was where it first occurred to me, where everyone did something to serve the evolution of the country because everyone loved where they lived. And they were uh, working together to make that happen using Colgate's resources and in support of growing Colgate. We were able to accomplish something Mandela gave Colgate an award for which was move black Africans from being a not, well, there was one person in the top of the hierarchy to making the hierarchy at the top, which we eventually changed some of that too, but made it representative or let's say reflective of the population. So we have 97% black Africans and then another couple percent Africans and uh, a bit of English. We were required by the new constitution to have that match what the population was in terms of the hierarchy. We were given five years to do that. We did it in six months and we didn't lay off anybody. We had one guy who left, an Afrikaner. But what it did with the day Mandela gave the group the award very publicly to say to people, don't say you can't do this. Look here what Colgate did. The day he did that, he said, uh, you have proven this can be done. And the, the Afrikaner who was uh, there that day, the black folks who were receiving this beautiful little statue handed it to him. And he was startled. He said, why? And this was after the meeting. Why, why are you handing this to us? And they said, he, they said, because you had the most work to do. And he said, I would have never thought that I could have, could have believed that people who weren't educated could be running this company in such a short period of time. That in itself, watching that, being close to you has made me ashamed. And I feel like I have so much to undo. And several of the other Afrikaners and one English guy said similar things that working on something else together, not working on their racism, but working on something else together made a difference. So I've since done that every company, give them something to do uh, or give, they give themselves. And I teach them how to do it. It's big and it's hard. They have to work together and we never talk about race, but slowly all of that dissolves because I know you, Mark, right? You're next to me. We have to pull the, we each have a promise we're made to do something for our country and even for our company, but often for our townships where we live. That process is what I learned, back to your question, of this crazy childhood that I had. Uh, at least that's one thread that I can bring. You right have up many of them. Time. You you really yeah. have <laughs> many of them. I've heard your talks before in, in, in your other books and you really, you bring, bring them out so nicely. And um, there's a couple, there's two more things that kind of almost comments kind of questions. So you, you use images a lot. So in the regenerative business, it's very circular, like a maze. It's, 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 and that this is the, the, uh, in the regenerative life. And so it's not only images that, and it's not the word connecting us, but it's how the principles, the pillars, how we're circular, how we're all kind of uh, <clears throat> in this together. Mm -hmm. 
And and in, in the in the beginning of our conversation, you really said, I'm not a coach, I'm an educator. And that's absolutely so true. And that's why I've been drawn to, to ask you for this podcast and I'm having this discussion. And I, I've gone to school, I've been to many universities, colleges, I still study them, reading every book that I can get my hands on. But the education that I've received is in, in a much different way. I didn't get very much of it in school. Um, similar to you, I think a lot of yours comes from your grandfather and your family situation and other situations, Thomas Kuhn. Um, for me, it's also similar. I, I've been to m- many schools and universities but I really feel that I was failed with a good education from school. I missed out on big history. I missed out on the true learnings. And so what I've done is when I read your book, I'm getting that education. I'm kind of educating myself through your readings and your writings and and pulling that out. And now that I have you live on the podcast and you're telling me these stories, I, I feel even more this connection and this, uh, this, uh, that not only you're educating me, but you're educating my listeners as well as on some different ways and, and, and some, uh, some models that you've gone through of regenerative business, regenerative life, and, and um, you know, how, how do we pr- break some of these cycles or do things in a more revealing matter, uh, manner or uh, more revelation? And so, um, I wanted to make that comment because uh, Sir Ken Robinson, he passed away uh, August right. 20, 21st, uh, 2020, uh, last year. And um, he also was saying, you know, we've been failed by our education system. We, ne- we need some other ways. And some of us has found ways to do that or found ways that work for us to, to move forward. But many have it. Many are still not readers. Many are still not, you know, going back to school. They're in, in stuck in a life in, in, in systems where they're working for a living. They're just trying to squeak by day by day. And so um, I, I, I appreciate the way you've just, you know, even though you're thinking you're recanting these stories of your life or, and what's happened in Colgate in Africa uh, uh, and, and those beautiful stories but in so, in many respects you're educating me and so um when i said one communication is important and you also said i'm not a coach i'm an educator i want you to know that's vital for me that's how i'm learning this is how i'm getting the education on regeneration sure. and things that i need to but i also would like to you you kind of touch upon that in your books as well on on I wouldn't say what your process is, is what you do. You write these books for yourself because you've asked yourself the question, mm-hmm. but it comes out as an education. So I don't know if you have something to, to say to that. It's not quite the question, but uh, it's it's really, I, I thank you for that. I mean, I thank you for for doing it this way because I, that's what I need and my a lot of my listeners need because I, I'm sure a lot of them don't know about these things. So, Yeah. Well, I have two reflections that I wrote a note to me uh, here. Uh, One is, I'm not drawing, I do have pictures, but I'm using frameworks. The reason the uh, Shark Cathedral Labyrinth is on the cover of the Regenerative Business is, that was another event I had uh, in my 40s where I write, that's a labyrinth, right? And it's not about, well, I walked the cathedral, uh, which is you know part of what burned last year tragically, um, and I keep wondering. I've never been able to find where the labyrinth was damaged. It taught me something about the, the frameworks compared to models. So you've been using them interchangeably. I want to advise you here Please. to consider looking at that models are programmatic prescriptions of how you do something. Build a model airplane, build a, uh, a car. You create a pattern and everybody follows it. And that's what the world is filled with. And they become mental models where we've got this way of uh, thinking. And I've forgotten the guy's name who in the early uh, part of the last century created the term uh, mental models, but I know Peter Senge picked it up for a while. Um, 
that is something we have to overcome. It's where our language is held and all the, they're all fragmented by nature. You can't make a uh, non-fragmented model. So I work with what the sacred teachers, Pythagoras, Socrates, um, Sri Aurobindo, they all work with something called frameworks, which didn't have answers on them like the model does. They have a place for questions. So they show you how things relate to one another. So the Enneagram I put on my cover is another idea that's been banalized terribly on the regenerative life. People make the personality types. It was the opposite. And the, the Assyrians who created, or the earliest known version we have of labyrinths, said that it was the way transformation happens in a whole and complete way, right? That's, but you'll see people saying, oh, I love that you have the Enneagram. What are you, a seven? Uh, I'm an eight. What are you? And I go, oh. I, it You're missing it, yeah. Me. There are people, and they miss the whole idea of how it works as a system. So first, I wanted to say that, that my books are filled with frameworks. And those frameworks are an invitation for you to form questions for yourselves. The words that are on there do not have pattern generating material like you're supposed to, well, they have pattern generating material for you to generate. They're not imposed and given patterns like models give you. And when people are in my membership communities, we do a lot of work so you learn to see the mental models you've got and how you can bring forward a framework. And like uh, you said, we're all circular. Well, I, well, there's nothing in living systems that's circular. There are cycles where something begins, ends, moves over time, connects with other cycles. I'm very worried with the concept of circular because that's a, and, and people who talk about closed system, there actually are no closed systems in living systems. Uh, we did a lot of work for charcoal. I think this is in my first book uh, with how it was you close what should be closed, but not try and close what is living. And so, Frameworks are designed to help us see the working of something alive, moving, changing, uh, nested, uh, and feel creating. So that's, I think, what is the pictures and the words, and those are the two things that came to me as you were speaking. And I, mean, I, I think words. that's perfect. It's a absolutely yeah. perfect because it leads into what I wanted to speak to you about naturally anyway, because you ended with nested systems throughout this whole time. You've, you've mentioned system, systemic thinking or systems um, as well. So I'm a, I'm a graduate of uh, Fritz Hof Capra courses, the systems view of life and, and this whole systems way of thinking. I obviously through through our podcast, and even though I've read the books and I'm familiar with those, I need to work on my communication. So you're giving me personally a lot of help on how to structure those frameworks and 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 to to work on those because I'll say, okay, we need a better operating system or framework or model for life. And so sometimes I use those terms or those words to too lackadaisical or too easily and and what what i really imprecisely imprecisely what i really mean is what you've you've alluded to is um the the current civilization framework frameworks that we have in our world honestly for me personally they're not working anymore and i feel a dis-ease around the world with those people I talk to or speak with or, or friends that I have and all over all over the world, that there's a similar dis-ease that these civilization frameworks are also not quite working. And it's whether it's a collapse, it's just, it's not a world that works for everyone. And so um, I need to work on, on, on that communication and work on that wording better. But I also feel exactly as you, you put it, these frameworks are, and, and the way we communicate in them and use those words have extreme meaning, not only to oneself, but also how they're perceived and received by others when, when, when we speak about them. And I see myself as 
as not just a podcast host, but also as an educator around sustainability and about mm. resilience and about environmental social governance and things. And so I'm all, always trying to find the right words to communicate better um, to, to do that. So I, I, you're a wonderful educator because you're correcting me in the moment and helping me to get to that right, right view. But what I wanted to speak about systems is the systems that not only did I learn about uh, Fr them from Fritz Holt Capra, but um, one of my most, I guess, idolized teachers that I've ever had was Lynn Margulis, uh, Dr. Lynn Margulis, uh, mm -hmm. Carl Sagan's first wife. And she wrote the book Microcosmos and uh, Symbiotic Planet and came up with the symbiotic earth and symbiogenesis. Right. And it's really that that we live in this, this world of... Uh, not just microorganisms, but this symbiosis that we're really connected to many things, our earth, to indigenous wisdom, and, and it's how the whole thing started. And it has a lot to do with this almost systems thinking or this nestled, nested systems that we see. And you've brought it up several times in our conversation, you bring it up in the books, but I want to, to now go to the next step. What do you truly mean by that? And, and how, how do we understand that? And uh, how, how do you think that can help us change our lives uh, by seeing this, these nested systems or understanding how to communicate about them or how they interact in our lives? Well, okay. So I have to go back to where you very first started. Uh, Please. And then make a suggestion about um, how people can improve their thinking. Uh, so because I don't think it is working on your communication and your words. That's too late. That's after the mind is thinking a particular way. So what you and I and everyone needs is a framework that causes us, you know, let's say invites us, right? More precisely. Uh, to be able to see what we're talking about differently. So when you think about the frameworks Lynn or Fritjof and uh, used, you probably get a picture in your mind. Of, and actually, I haven't seen them use a lot of frameworks. I'm realizing I form my own frameworks out of what I think they're doing and how things are a whole. Uh, working on our thinking because it produces what we see and then produces what we say. So I think that's first kind of precision. Now, having said that, what I think uh, nested systems do, they're like one inside of another inside of another is not accurate completely, but it's a way of getting us off a of flatland view. And I'm sure you've read the book Flatland, right? Yeah. Right. And Flyland says, we end up seeing everything as parallel. So when, we, when you do that sentence, you just confess to doing where you say connections, frameworks, models, you're flatlanding people's world. You're saying these are all the same thing, mix and match. Or when you say sustainability, restoration, regeneration, you're flattening the world. And that's the way most people see it. They can't see uh, I, I wrote a paper on the five different levels of interpretation of systems thinking. I'm always working on levels because the world is made up of some things are more encompassing than others. If we mess up our planet, we ain't got no neighborhoods. We have no humans, right? We are nested in neighborhoods in a life shed in a region that is made up of a, a number of life sheds, there's in a continent which does not stop at where the water hits it. And our ability to see that nest that we live in is a really important first step to, to the seeing what I said is the work, which is learning to see the working of a nested system. The reason, and we're not educated, not only were you not educated in big history, uh, which is sad, or me either, but we're not, we're not educated in uh, ecological, uh, well, ecology is part of the living system, or not part, shame on me, embedded in 
uh, other system, just changing those words. So instead of saying we're a part of something, no, nope, we're embedded in something. And that means I have to go say, well, how if we're embedded, if I'm embedded in the Puget Sound, uh, north, uh, west part of the United States, what does that mean? How does my life have to work in order to be doing my role in that nested system of the Puget Sound region? And if I can come to see uh, that every act I'm taking is creating an effect, and I, I don't actually like Lynn's term of um, uh, synergistic or a symbiotic. symbiotic. Right, because, and it's not that it's not a good word, but I think it's still too flat. So if symbiotic sees the bird on the back of the critter in eating its bugs, right? So it becomes too flat. The uh, idea, and I didn't come up with the idea of nested systems, it's ancient. Uh, my grandfather used it uh, or some version. So you could see the working of something with one life form, a whole, embedded in another life form, a whole, embedded in another life form. And if you can do that, now you have a door. I mean, it's, it's not completely accurate to say the way I'm doing it, but it makes the mind move from flatland all things are the same. And therefore humans have a right to get what they want from the watershed and from uh, the trees and whatever. We're all on the same level. We have as much right as they do to understanding we're both embedded, trees, forests, uh, nature, humans, uh, other animals are embedded in a larger system. That's why I say and throw off handedly all the time some people ask me about nested systems. It's an education process to learn to see the working of some things that have more power. Uh, power is probably a, a slightly not perfect word, but impact or effect, let's use effect over others. But at the same time, me as a small individual also have that. That's seeing the working. So. That, that one is good explanation as I hope to do, but it may oh, give it's a beautiful. Here, uh, there are so many nuggets of wisdom. I only have four questions left for you before we're done, and and the this first one is actually the hardest one that I have uh, for you. I don't think it's hard as uh, at all from our discussion so far. It's um kind of a vision or you educating us on what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? It's, it's one where all we work on is educating us to be able to use the right mind on ourselves, uh, with others, and then we will create it. It won't be the same. The problem with the world that works for all is it actually assumes a generic answer. So the, it's hard when you ask it that way because it means I've got some magical answer and I don't believe in visions. I think those are anthropocentric projections. So all of that then makes sense. To me, it's a capability for people to connect with place and understand they live within a life shed. Uh, they live within a family. They live within their, a body that they either chose or depending on how that works cosmologically. Um, and if we can build this mind that can see living systems at work and see these seven first principles and indigenous peoples have lived by and spiritual teachers, um, what we'll do is each moment in time, each place, people will learn to come together to create what it takes for it to work then. So there's no, I mean, in-state visions are is a humanistic, uh, anthropocentric idea. There's every moment, every day, based on understanding how something works, uh, how we can be to, uh, together in different roles, picking up the uh, work that is ours to do there. And then that community of people in that place will determine what it works there. So. I try and get people to stop saying, I want to change the world or I want to make a world that works for all because, and I say it, I have to catch me too, right? I'm in this culture. 
but learning that visions are human ideas and that there's no life shed that has a vision of what's trying to be. It is a working, living, conversing, uh, discovering, revealing process that all the, the bugs, the biota all know uh, their role and they're working in that whole. And that is what uh, we have to get over the idea that what you asked me was even a good question. <laughs> great, great. I love it. Uh, if there was a message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable or regenerative takeaway that really has the power to change their life, what would it be? Uh, uh, kind of your message. So it's another very bad question, worse than the last one. Uh, and you also conflated things and put two things in a flatland, sustainable or regeneration. They're not the same thing. And you uh, diminish discernment when you put them side by side in a flatland view because people already can't see what we're going to lose if we don't get back to understanding what regeneration means. And let go of what sustainability means, which is a made up idea that has nothing to do with how living systems work. Uh, so I also don't believe I have any messages that are of any use to any human being, because that would mean I'm a advisor, which is another word I don't use. I'm not a coach, but I'm also not an advisor. My education is not on the content you should hold in your mind. But the capability you need to be able to come to your own answer for you, because I tell people, don't trust me. Never. Don't assume anything I say is right. Because if you do, you're working from a, an epistemology, which is upside down from what I believe works, which is each individual creates their own understanding out of their lived experience, which they reflect on. And then they keep educating themselves, getting more capable, doing what you talk about, you do, read, et cetera. Uh, and don't ever ask others for advice. Don't ask them for feedback. That's a behavioralist view of that you only can get it from outside that it's not in you. And that's fundamental to this work. So I guess if there's advice, it's don't trust anybody but yourself. I love that. And, and I mean, that... You've kind of added an, uh, another question for me that you bring up that I do want to. Uh, that <laughs> well, I we're going to run out of time because I got another. Yeah. I have another yeah, call, I, so we have to be I careful. Will, I will definitely hurry because we're almost done. And that is, I, and I, I've said this before, so I believe that we're truly um, that all the answers are within us already, and I, I don't want to get esoteric or however you want to look at it. Yeah, we just need to ask ourselves the questions and then somehow pull the answer out of ourselves or, or answer it ourselves and not look for it somewhere else. I think that um, why religions or network marketing or some of these things work so well or have so many followers is because it's always someone else giving you a guiding frame or a dogma right. or telling you what to do, when to do it. Instead, I think as homo sapiens or as species amongst all the other species of our planet we're already born with some some ways with the answers but we need to ask ourselves the questions and and go through that process to pull that answer out and i, I that's just a thought i have wh whether it's true but i i try I, I sometimes say you know just ask the question yourself instead of waiting for me to give you the answer or someone else all right thank you there's a hazard in what you just said, because I don't actually agree with what you just said, but it would sound like I did from what I said a minute ago. What I believe is the capacity to find the answer is within you if you're awake. Because if you ask yourself, you will give yourself answers you already know, become attached to or identified with. We all think we have the answer, that's the problem. And we have it not only for us, but others. But what we want to do is trust ourselves to find it and to be able at this moment to find it and then to evolve it and then let go of what we had as an answer before. And that's a capability building. And so instead of throughout your life reading for answers, which are all out there, 
work on building the capability to be a better discerner, a better evolver, a better uh, developed human being with a better state of being so I can manage myself and see when I'm using old answers and I have an attachment to it and, uh, and I'm identified with it as it's me. If we're there, then there are no answers in us. There's only uh, old, I, I'm not even sure what the right word is, but they're fixed in us. What we have is the capability as a human, if we develop ourselves, to be able to find evolving answers for a moment in time in a place with a group of people. And then it's almost like set fire to it. And I have a, a, a ground rule or principle for myself is I'm never able, I'm never allowed, I don't allow myself to present a PowerPoint that I've ever used before in exactly the same way. I don't give a talk. People say, I'd like to have you do that talk. I said, too late, I already did it. Go listen to the recording. You need to challenge yourself to be alive, awake, and capability building so that you increasingly can do that in the moment with a new group of people and new circumstances for what is needed. The last question I have, and then we're done, is really, what have you experienced or learned so far in your your life's journey, professional journey that you would have loved to know from the start? I don't even understand that question. I mean, I've <laughs> and I, I nothing, absolutely nothing. Because it's about the journey. It's about my okay. You talked about earlier that there are people who will never. They're running through their life, whatever they're doing. I believe that what fuels consciousness is my work, my disturbances, my discovery, my work on myself. And any day I can bring consciousness, I'm probably creating more than I need for me right that moment because consciousness is a very powerful thing in the field. And I believe it can be shared. I believe that you, I, and I can, I mean, that's the whole idea of dedicate karma that I learned from the Mahayana teachers. If you do your work, you're doing enough for you and others can draw on that. David Hawkins wrote a book called Power Versus Force, which I uh, saw a popularized version of that. So I wouldn't want anything to be any different because every moment I've been able to bring consciousness, I'm doing my work as a human being. I got to keep doing that, not wishing anything was different. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Carol, for letting us inside of your ideas and for educating us. Uh, you're a wonderful educator. I love your books, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today and give us your insights. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Mark. Thank you.